So on today's video I thought I'd talk a bit about the Boss Samplerage label compilations. Stay tuned and I'll tell you more. So the idea for doing Boss Samplerage, the first one, uh, in the summer of 2000 came about because of pretty much what every other label was doing at that time. Obviously 10 years had passed since I'd last done a compilation LP on Boss Tunage, uh, or started to do one, which was the Floor 81 that came out in 1992. Um, the compilation LP as an art form, uh, you could argue by the year 2000, had dramatically changed. Um, you have to remember in the mid 90s, uh, compilation LPs tended to be kind of gimmicky. Um, by gimmicky I mean that the, you, there were quite a lot of tribute uh, comps that came out where there was bands covering a particular band uh, and released like that. Um, so the actual idea of a compilation LP had totally sort of morphed by the end of like the 90s and uh, 1999, 2000. Um, partly led by a lot of the larger American labels. Um, I think by this time Epitaph and Fat Rec were, were doing kind of label samplers that were cheap price. Uh, so I basically had the idea that because we had quite a few releases that we'd now done in the year that I'd do a similar thing. So the first Boss Samplerage uh, comp came out in time for the Unknown Tour in July 2000. So I think that was actually pressed at the same time as Pop Art and the Ish CD. Um, so yeah, so I put quite a few jobs through the uh, CD plant all at the same time. Uh, I also put them all through the same time quickly because remember, if, as I said, I think on the unknown video, um, there were rumours because uh, the company that I was working for, the CD plant, um, was going to potentially shut the Battersea plan and move all the CD manufacturing up to Telford in Shropshire. And I didn't know whether I was going to actually be uh, working or in a job. So I thought I'll get these through whilst I'm still here. <laughs> Um, just in case. So the, it was quite minimalistic artwork that I put on that first comp. Um, I'd basically seen a couple of jobs have been done through the CD plant where they'd used silver print on the, you know, the shiny silver of the CD and it looked really effective so I, I decided to sort of carry that idea through um, with terms of the booklet and inlay. And the idea was to do it really, really cheap. So I think from memory, Boss Slamperage would cost you two pounds post paid mail order um, for sort of like 20 odd bands, you know, and we, we crammed it on because you could get nearly 80 minutes on a CD. So we crammed the CD as much as we could. Um, and then it was just literally uh, a comp of what we'd recently released, what was upcoming, um, and just sort of to, to kind of showcase the label. Uh, and I think it was one that I did mainly for Cargo, who were distributing me at that time as well, um, because we wanted it to sell into like um, record shops and stuff at like sort of like no more than three pounds ninety nine, which was kind of equivalent to a, a seventy single, and sort of on a par. I think I, I do remember that um, Epitaph label samplers cost four ninety nine, so I wanted to make sure I undercut them to be even cheaper price label sampler at the time. So it's kind of interesting looking at it. There were twenty six songs on this label sampler and it's kind of interesting when I've looked at it that it's a mix of definitely what I'd just released and what was upcoming. So for example you have Fatty Jones on there, one of the songs off their CD single that uh, Mother Stoke put out because I was already speaking to Dickie at this point about doing the Jones album Gravity Blues um, and other stuff and pieces there. Vehicle Derek uh, went and recorded a demo song um, somewhere somehow um, because we'd obviously been speaking to them about their upcoming album as well but nothing was recorded yet and there's a mixture of other things that you know were all planned and um, yeah and it was kind of you know it's, it's a really good snapshot of where the where the label was at I guess in sort of like the summer of 2000. Um, the scary thing is is to look and see that 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 the Boss Samperage the first one was Bostage 520 so it's the 20th CD release within a year um, but we'd already got plans and I think it's mentioned up to sort of like Scarpa on here and their, their um, CD came out at the same time as well but they were Bostage 530 so I'd already sort of like got 30 CDs out pretty much in just over a year and I think it did kind of open a few doors and people may have discovered the label through that sampler um, just thinking like oh what's this you know and um, 
or been seeing the adverts in Fracture but hadn't potentially heard the bands. So I think it did sort of open it and I'm, I'm sure there were people who bought the label sampler from us and then would come back and do a, a further mail order of you know some of the bands that they'd heard and, and really liked. So it did seem to work. But of course at the speed that I was releasing stuff at the time, um, come the next year, we brought out Boss Sampridge 2, which again was another label sampler, 29 songs this time on this one. Um, and yeah, that had everything that we were kind of planning and new stuff that was coming up. Um, and um, it just sort of uh, amazes me really, the sort of like the speed looking back now that the label was developing and working with so many new bands all at the same time. Uh, and just how I had the time, <laughs> in all honesty, to do it. And Boss Sampridge 2 was given the catalogue number Bostage 5. 40, but there are actually sort of uh, things that are on there that we were up into like Bostage 550 or 551, you know, so um, you know, we, we were sort of like um, going at quite an alarming rate on these. And as I started to get involved with the more labels doing co-releases, as well as new bands for the label as well, the whole thing was snowballing. So by the time you get to 2002 with Bostage Boss Samplerage 3, which is the third label sampler, it was a 56 track double CD, which I think we sold for four pounds or something ridiculous. Um, um, but that one is Bostage 580. So we'd exponentially grown another 40 releases in the space of a year. So it was quite a lot of work to like compiling these and putting them on. And I'd literally, I remember, used to have a list of all the bands we'd done stuff with and tick them off what songs they were going to do and, and then sequence it. The masters for these, I actually, by this point, um, had a, a tracks data separate system. And so I had a tracks data CD player and then I had a tracks data CD recordable. And what I used to do is get 80 minute CDRs and I'd actually compile these at home myself. I didn't need to use studio time like we'd had in the Floor 81 days. And then I'd give it to a studio house to just make the final master and just, you know, check the levels and all that. And I remember on Bus Sampler is 3, I'd done the CD1 and I was a bit stuck for time. And I got halfway through doing the CD2. And with this Trex data, you had to sort of like pause it and then press play, you know, to make sure that, you know, and the thing's doing. And sometimes it wouldn't start recording properly. And if it did that, it would do put in four seconds of silence. So I got halfway through the CD2, and then there was four seconds of silence there. And I was like, this has taken me like an hour or two hours, you know, and I've really got to get this done. I'll sod it, I'll leave it on there, what am I gonna do? I mean, literally, so track 15 on this master was four seconds of silence. Um, and it was gonna be 30 tracks in total. And I carried on doing it, and I got then, I think, to about, oh, I think then it was about track 22, and the same thing happened again. They put another four seconds of silence. So I finished it off, we had 30 songs on this. But I was thinking, how am I going to, you know, so what am I going to say these two four seconds of silence are on this master? You know, because I can't be asked, in all fairness, to spend another three, four hours doing this. I think it got to about nine o'clock on a Sunday night and I was back in work the next day and I was just like, you know, when am I going to do it? So I came up with one of my Baldrick cunning plans. Now, obviously, I'll be speaking about Benny, which was the band I sang in um, on a later video when we get to that. But Benny was sort of going into the studio, I think in a couple of weeks time from that, we were gonna kind of do a seven inch single. And um, I came up with this idea, I remembered, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there was a, John Cage uh, did this piece of sort of performance art music called Four Minutes 33 Seconds. And basically what it involved was a pianist lifting up the piano, sitting there for four minutes 33, not playing a note, and then putting it back down again. So I thought, well, that's four minutes 33. We could do a speeded up cover version that lasted four seconds, four seconds of silence. So Benny appeared as the speeded up cover version of John Cage's four minutes 33 demo and studio version. So I actually think that Benny is potentially a Guinness World Record band because we actually appeared on a CD before we'd even recorded a note. But it's also interesting looking at sort of like the later Boss Sandwiches because obviously there was ideas of uh, things that we were going to be releasing that then actually never materialised. So for example, on both Boss Sandwich 3 and 4, there are Travis Cut songs because we've been speaking to Travis Cut about doing their next album and they'd recorded four songs ready for it and um, it never ended up happening. And um, so, yeah, so they appear on the label sampler, even though 
we've never released anything by Travis Cat. And so by the time we get to Boss Sampridge 4 in 2003, the first track on CD1 was an Australian band called Something With Numbers, who I'd actually been sort of uh, conversing about releasing their record in the UK. Uh, so they appeared on there because they say, oh, I'm doing the label sample, is it okay to uh, put it, yeah, yeah, sure, no, fine, go ahead, what have you. And then we never actually ended up releasing anything by them, we never heard from them again. Um, so they're on that sampler, even though that's their only ever appearance on a Boss Tunage release. Um, so yeah, so it was, uh, it was kind of scary and I think by that time, you know, we were having to go for like larger page CD booklets to just literally fill in all the catalogue and what was available on, on the label samplers. But alongside all these label samplers, I was also doing other compilations. So um, we used to do a mailing list uh, mail out, which was sort of like a 20 page kind of fanzine, which came with a free CD. So I was doing interim samplers of what was on the label as well. So it got really confusing and hard to remember what songs from which bands had been on what sample on what samplers that we'd done. Um, so yeah, so we used to send out like a mail order catalogue, and that you know we would press like a thousand CDs at a time, and a thousand catalogues which would be mailed out to everyone. So everyone would get every sort of th three, four, five months a full list of what we had in our distro. It was like a big mail order catalogue, a little bit of fanzine at the front of it, and a sort of like 25 plus song uh, sampler CD as well all for free in the post. So by the time of Boss Sampridge 4 in 2004, I came up with what I thought was a really good idea, which was to actually put the CD1, because these were double sampler CDs, I was gonna put the CD1 with the booklet and inlay in that mail out. And then people could just buy CD2 extra for two pounds, yeah? Which sounded great on paper, but it meant that I had to press additional copies of CD2 just in case every single person decided to take that up. So for years I had surplus copies of the, the CD2 of Boss Slambridge 4, because not obviously not everyone was, was asked to go and uh, pick up the second CD. But you know, I think from sort of like two, three, four onwards, we would we must have been doing 1,500 or 2,000 of these sampler CDs each time, um, the ones that were actually the shop retail ones, and then at like a 1,000 of, of the ones that were just going out in the mail order catalogues. And we did start to work on Boss Sampridge 5, and there was definitely an idea for that, and I remember Welly actually did some artwork for it, ready, um, which unfortunately I can't find uh, now, but um, there was a plan for a fifth you know, Boss Sampridge 5 was planned, but then um, with everything that happened in 2004 with the label and how things were going, and I'll explain more on later videos about that, um, it was shelved. And also by 2004, 2005, you know, the, the way that when we restarted in 2005, there was never any plan to do a label sampler um, sort of moving forward. Things were had progressed quite a lot um, uh, in a short space of time. So you had the advent of like MySpace there. So that we ended up using like having a MySpace page where we could have like the four or so songs of the latest releases on there and direct that to people. And it was, and then obviously Facebook came in as well. So obviously the way people were um, finding out about labels, sampler, you know, labels and sampling this stuff didn't necessarily need a physical CD anymore. But of course we have done other compilations over the years. So um, I'll obviously speak on other videos about the instant singles collection. Uh, three comps that we did because they were a different beast really uh, and also we did the 20 year anniversary too much music too many bands four cd set which i'll talk about on a separate thing and uh, how that was a, a bit of a beast to uh, compile um, but for as far as boss samples go that's it for this video i'll speak to you on the next one cheers